Hello, greetings, welcome. This is the start of our next speaker series event. We hold these once a month and are delighted to have uh, Dr. Richard Petty with us today as our speaker. We also have another series ongoing called Coincidence Cafe with new hosts and topics every month. And it has an emphasis on people having an opportunity to share their stories in small groups and in the full group if they would like and um, consider, reflect upon and share aspects or full stories about their own coincidence experiences. And the speaker series, we bring people who have thought very deeply for, for quite a long time about these matters to share their insights with us. And we are delighted um, here to have Richard come and join us for uh, the Coincidence Project. Our vision is to illuminate the invisible currents that connect and unify us. And I think the way that you think and view reality, Richard, uh, helps to make what is sometimes invisible much more visible. So I know you'll be helping us uh, achieve our vision today. So thank you very much. And I turn it over to you. OK, thank you very much, Julius. And good morning, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. And indeed, I am going to try to introduce some ideas that I'm certainly not going to say are novel. But the way that I tend to think about some issues is perhaps very slightly different. So I'm going to try first to justify this um, apparently rather nomic title, Coincidence, Kaleidoscope, Boundaries and the Glimpse. So let me explain a little bit about um, what we're talking about here. And as you can see, our um, computers are misbehaving. We've been misbehaving all morning. But I thought I would just start with a kaleidoscope picture. Most of you are probably too young to remember these, but I remember as a kid having one of these kaleidoscopes where you would look at the thing, you'd squint through it and see different colours, and you'd turn it and there'd be complete chaos and then suddenly a new pattern would emerge. And I'm going to suggest that we are going through a kaleidoscopic change. And I'm going to justify that or try to in the next few minutes. So what are we going to try and discover today? The first is what I refer to as the shifting cosmic kaleidoscope. That sounds high flown, but I'm going to suggest that we are changing dramatically. Humans are changing. The world is changing. Some of it is very obvious, but some is a little bit more subtle. And I'm going to be coming back to that in just a moment. We're going to be looking at what I refer to as the rapid dissolution of boundaries and borders. And I don't just mean this in terms of, of countries or people, but there are some very fundamental conceptual changes that are one of the reasons that both in people and in the world out there, there are a lot of changes. I'll give you a very simple example. Some of you may be aware that since 2012, there has been a tripling of the rates of depression and suicide in teenagers. And we think we have some ideas as to why this is happening. But it certainly suggests, and it's not just in the United States, it's, it's virtually every country except China, that this has been happening. And we think we have some ideas as to why it's happening. And we're going to talk about this in just a second. And finally, why, in my view, coincidence and synchronicity I'm going to be talking a lot about the two of them, their relationship. Provide evidence of a glimpse. This is not a new term, the idea of the glimpse. It's been talked about for millennia, particularly in India and China. The idea that we sometimes get a glimpse of another reality or another part of ourselves. It's something that happens very commonly during the deeper stages of meditation, where people get a glimpse of what we might refer to as a higher self or um, a larger reality. And I'm going to suggest a little bit more about that. So I'm first going to talk a little bit about what I mean by a larger reality. And I'm going to make a few uh, statements that are based on a lot of observation. Um, just self-disclosure, I've been involved in meditation for exactly 50 years. And uh, also doing Tai Chi and other things, I've also helped a lot of other people with meditation. I've taught meditation and Tai Chi myself um, for many years. And so what I'm going to say is based on personal observation, as well as a great deal of research, 
books, papers, and talking to people literally all over the world. I've had the pleasure and privilege of visiting almost 80 countries and meeting and talking to people there. So the first thing is, what do I mean by this larger reality? It's my belief and perception that we're all of us embedded in a vast, alive, richly conscious, blissimous, which I mean um, endowed with meaning, reality that's living, that lies beyond the normal boundaries of perception. And people have glimpsed this, again, my word, glimpse, again, for millennia. And one of the things that's always been so incredibly interesting is that throughout the universe, throughout the world, everybody always reports precisely the same things. And that's what we're going to come back to again and again over the next few minutes. It's also my perception, and again, not just mine, that everything in the cosmos is text. And one of the things that is absolutely essential is that we have to read it. There's an old statement that's very well known to therapists about dreams. That's, and I think it goes back to Babylonian Talmud, if I remember, it could be uh, wrong. But the, the idea was that if you ever have a dream that is not interpreted, it's like a letter that hasn't been read. Well, I'm going to suggest that that applies not just to dreams, but it also applies to synchronicities, to coincidences, as it does to symptoms, symptoms that individuals get and societies get. Many times people don't actually try to understand or decode a dream, a synchronicity or a symbol um, or a symptom. And by doing that, they're missing out because coincidences and synchronicities are also text that we need to understand. I'm going to come back to this theme several times in the next few minutes. The next issue is one for which I think there is overwhelming evidence. One of the biggest issues that we all of us face is this illusion of separation. There is a ton of research in physics, in parapsychology, lots of other areas apart from experience, the consciousness is actually non-local, that it transcends our normal ideas of space and time. And when we get a glimpse, and again, one of the ways of getting a glimpse is for meditation, Tai Chi, or a synchronicity or a dream, we see in very brief flashes a new vision of reality that's larger and it's more accurate. And it's well beyond what we call the promissory note. That's not my term. It was Mary Midgley who first came up with this of the materialist scientific view. What I mean by this promissory note, there is a view within science and most people in society still hold this, that a simple materialist explanation will eventually be able to tell us about everything. Everything in the world can all be reduced to molecules, um, simple interactions. In fact, there's a well-known physicist who repeats what Lord Kelvin said in the 19th century, that basically we've learned everything there is to learn. There's nothing more. And everything can be reduced to a simple material model. And I'm going to suggest that that is absolute bovine excreta, that there is actually a great deal more. And we are getting messages all the time, and most of us are walking around with our eyes closed. And what we need to do, and I'm going to suggest this today, and give you some suggestions as to how we can open our eyes a little bit more. The last couple of points is that I think that we often make a mistake in trying to take apparently inexplicable phenomena such as um, coincidences and try to analyze them all intellectually. I didn't think that we're supposed to do that. I think that they are signals and messages that we're supposed to respond to. And I'm going to, again, come back to this 
I want to give you an overview first, and then we're going to get very specific. I'm going to suggest that coincidences of an inexplicable phenomena are like little bridges to another world that we're all sitting in right now, where you are sitting in your room in front of your computer screen right now. You're embedded in something much larger. It's just our senses normally don't allow us to see it. But what I'm going to suggest is that we, all of us, occasionally have experiences that kick us in the posterior and essentially force us to look at a different worldview that's beyond just the materialist. And I think there are multiple phenomena like this. Synchronicity is, of course, one of them. But there are others, Marian apparitions. If you've ever been around one of these uh, apparent visions of Mary that have been seen not just in the West, but in other countries. There's a very well-known apparition site in Egypt. There are a number of these. And even something I normally never used to talk about in public, but have been very interested in, as was Carl Jung, who first proposed synchronicity, is UFO phenomena. Not because I believe there are little green men in my backyard, but because I think they are telling us something very important about what is happening to us psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. And what I think is that these are symbolic signs. That's not a tautology. After being immersed for such a long time in rationalism and mechanistic views. So let me now ask, is this just words or is there any uh, evidence? Let me start with a picture. This picture, yes, you're quite right. There is a man standing on one side and a fellow in front of him who's flying through the air. This is an extraordinary picture. It's actually not a hoax. The man on the right of the screen was actually my own teacher for many years. So his Tai Chi um, teacher, he's uh, no longer with us. Um, he taught many of us to project what he referred to as energy or at other people. And the key point here is it's about interaction between two people. If he tried doing this to a stone or a rock, he wouldn't move. It has a lot to do with the sensitivity of the person to whom he's doing this. I can well remember that I was um, at a meeting. I met somebody who'd done a little bit of work on Qigong and what have you. And he said, I've never experienced any of this. I didn't know if I can. And I said, well, let's try. And I first of all demonstrated that I could push him from three or four feet away. And eventually I showed him that there's multiple levels and in front of some interested onlookers, eventually I was shoving him from 21 feet away. And we measured it, and there's reasons for measuring it. But the point is, it's always a matter of interaction between two people. It's like a healing interaction in therapy. It's all about the interaction between two people. And it's always about interaction that actually leads to seeing another world. It never happens in a vacuum. It's a little bit like the old question about if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it. Does it make a noise? Well, of course it doesn't in the sense that noise requires that somebody has to pick it up. If you had a sensor somewhere, would it make a bang as it hit the ground? Well, of course it would, but would it then make a noise that somebody else would pick up? No, that's a separate issue. This is interaction, but let me now show you something else. I hope that um, this isn't all being covered up by uh, things because that, the question is, what do all these have in common? Up in the top left, that is actually a sand pattern that's um, taken by putting sand on a metal tray and actually vibrating it. I became very interested in this many years ago because I started looking at these. There was a, a book that was written by um, uh, an Israeli chemist um, 
dynamics, <laughs> um, cell arrangements or something like that, a long time ago. But what was so interesting was that, in fact, sound waves produce mandalas. These are these sacred symbols of the self that Jung and others talked about. Let's look at the next one. This is a guitar. This, of course, is a giraffe, zebra, leopard. Um, this is a form of uh, puff of fish. And this is a brain, and this is an electromagnetic spectrum. So why am I showing you this? There's recently been some extraordinarily interesting work, um, primarily by one scientist um, from Germany, who has demonstrated that all of these different shapes and structures, they're all dynamic structures. Um, a zebra's skin doesn't always stay like that. It's dynamic. It changes. Every one of these can be described by precisely the same mathematical formulae. And you'd think, what on earth does this have to do with anything? Well, the, the self, vibrations, electromagnetic spectra, skin, sound, the brain, all of these are dictated by the same kinds of principles. It's very interesting that part of her work has actually had to do with the effects of LSD on the brain and how it actually produces a different kind of coherence in the brain. What this is telling us is that there is a fundamental underlying set of principles that are responsible for a lot of what we observe in the world, going from the very rarefied, specific consciousness creating, self creating, all the way up to vibrations and guitars. Let's look a little bit further. Some of you, I'm sure, recently heard about Rakus, Rakus the orangutan. I'm only showing one of his pictures because there's another one which is a bit yucky. He started over here, and I don't know if you can see my pointer moving around under his right eye. He got a nasty old cut. And he was observed in, in uh, Borneo. He was observed finding a particular vine, chewing it up and smearing it on himself. And why this was deemed to be so interesting was because the vine in question has some healing properties as well as having uh, a, a something that's bactericidal. That was as far as all the analysis online went. I was a little disappointed because this was reported everywhere for 24 hours. It was the news of the day. And there were journalists all over the world who kept reporting this, and none of them contextualized it. Well, what do I mean? Let's have a look and see. Here's a new word for you, zoopharmacognancy. Long word, you can forget it now. But what it actually refers to is this. It has to do with animals that self-medicate. And it would have been much better to put the story of Rakus into a broader context, because it actually tells us something very fundamental. In the same way that those vibrations, those mathematical formulae, are, can actually predict so many things. I first became interested in this back in January of 1975. There was an in the British Medical Journal on anticoagulants, and there was a little throwaway line that it had been observed in the east of England and that when mice and rats ate rat poison, they would go out onto the sand dunes. This is a place called East Anglia, and they would eat marum grass. Now, marum grass is um, it's, it's found all over the place, but it's loaded with vitamin K. They wouldn't eat anything else, just the marum grass. So I looked into this, um, ended up speaking to the, um, the author of, and so on. And it turns out that this has been a very well-known observation for years. But think about that for a second. How is it that these little creatures would know that that particular grass is loaded with vitamin K? Because obviously no little mummy mouse is saying to little baby mouse, well, my precious, if you ever eat rat poison, this is what you do. There's a ton of other examples. Um, you've probably seen cats and dogs that eat grass if they've got an upset tummy. Very well known. This is a separate phenomenon. Herd animals, horses, uh, we keep horses, so I'm very familiar with this. 
we've seen it with many other herd animals that if they get an upset tummy or something they even an infection they will together seek out things to settle their tummies or deal with infections jane goodall was the first person to describe chimps that would swallow whole leaves without chewing them because by doing that they got parasites out of their innards remarkable and there's actually scores may even now be hundreds of examples of this in humans there have been some phenomena that have, are very rarely discussed some of you may have heard of curare curare is still occasionally used in surgery um, it's uh, basically um, uh, paralyzes muscles and it was initially discovered because it was in the amazon jungle um, people would use curare and put it on the tips of their um, blowpipes you know the thing is that you have to get you know just the right amounts and there are 37 ingredients if you put too much in you can't eat the meats if it's not enough the little creature whatever it is isn't going to fall out of the tree nobody quite knows how they discovered the right 37 ingredients but it's very easy to spoil the production of curare and this has been looked at there's actually been research papers on this very topic nobody knows how it was done initially but it's actually passed on in songs how to make the curare and there are other examples um Chinese herbal remedies. The research base on Chinese herbal remedies in the West is very small. In China, it's absolutely enormous. And Chinese herbal concoctions have been used for probably nearer 3,000 years, as far as we can tell. And many of these combinations are highly complex. How do people find them? Well, they were discovered literally millennia ago, as I've said, 3,000 years and they are passed on in books but we also know that the very good practitioners do a lot of it a lot of the production intuitively this is actually not such an odd thing most clinicians have had an experience or have seen good practitioners who use medical intuition i well remember seeing one of my bosses when I was a youngster and we'd just seen a patient we we're walking away and he suddenly walked back and said I need to look at the thyroid there was nothing to suggest the thyroid gland in the neck had anything wrong with it but he walked back and found a tumor in the thyroid it wasn't visible the person had it covered up he somehow picked it up I can give you a huge number of examples like this of clinicians who suddenly just know or something and in each case what is so important with the animals with rachis finding the stuff to put in its face in each case there's a search for help but that is not a random search think about this if rachis had to go out there and look for every single vine to stick on his face poor fellow wouldn't have survived and similarly if the marum grass eating rats and mice that simply cannot be natural selection they know a something it's almost as if a searchlight goes out and they look for help that leads me now to tell you something about how your brain works because much of what we learned in school is not accurate the old idea was simple model I am looking at you right now. Photons hitting my retina, going back with sorts of lots of jiggery pokery to the back of my brain, which is where the visual centers are, it turns the image upside down, and then I can see you. Well, actually, that's not how vision works at all. What actually happens is that the brain makes constant predictions about what it expects to see. And as a result of that, we start seeing things at any given time you're only actually aware of about three percent of the sensory inputs that are hitting your body 
all the rest is a matter of prediction. But you'd say, okay, that's fine, factoid. But this is where it gets more interesting. Since the very first hours of life after conception, there's an inextricable link between your immune system and your nervous system. It's very well known in neurology and psychiatry that when people are struggling with depression, schizophrenia, bipolar, PTSD, lots of other things, they typically have disturbances of the immune system. Well, we have a pretty good idea why. Because the two systems are so closely linked, we now tend to think about a neuroimmune system in the brain and the rest of the body. What is interesting is that both the immune system and the nervous system work on predictions. In fact, they also use grammatical structures. 50 years ago, 1974, Hans Jörner won the Nobel Prize in medicine. And he was a, worked on immunology. And his Nobel lecture was what he called a generative grammar of the immune system. And he pointed out in that, so this is 50 years ago, that the brain and the immune system, both of them use the same rules of grammar and what we would now say the same rules of prediction. As you're listening to me, yes, you're hearing words that are hitting your ears, but you're also predicting what I'm going to say next. And you keep correcting that in milliseconds. It happens so fast that you don't realize it. But this is how we actually communicate. It now looks from every piece of evidence that we have. I am obviously particularly interested in the human body, the energy systems, the brain, how they all link together. But in every one of these, every system, it seems that prediction and the quest for novelty, constantly searching, looking for new things, is absolutely a fundamental principle. So why does this matter? As we're looking around, as Rakus is looking around the trees, looking for the right vine, as the little mice and rats are looking for the right marum grass, it's as if their consciousness is hunting around and crystallizes possibilities, potentials. Let me take this a step further now. I want to introduce you to four words that are often used interchangeably, but then they mustn't be. And if we get this, it'll help us um, in the next few minutes. We have feelings. You all have feelings. They're often mixed up with emotions, but actually feelings are, are very precise. They're neurochemical, they're neurological. They happen not just in our heads, they work in our whole body. I bet you've had the experience sometimes of having a shock and you feel it in your tummy or your heart or your chest or in your neck. That's, again, that's feeling. The second is affect. This is how one is affected by something. So this is a, a basically how you are beginning to react to a feeling. So I can cause a feeling in you by a shock, by something that's happening. If you're hungry, I can even maybe make you eat some aspartame or something, and that will induce feelings of anxiety almost immediately, and if you're sensitive to it. Affect is how you react to that. The third is emotion. Emotion we used to think of as just emotion, just a feeling. No, it's not. It's separate. And it involves also cognition. There's thought involved with it. And the last of them is what we refer to technically as moods. And these are slowly changing emotional states. So emotion, affect, and feelings. Feelings is instantaneous, extremely rapid, often much too fast for you to even have noticed it. Affect is slower, emotion is slower yet. We often say that emotion, affect, and feelings are a little bit um, like the weather and moods are like the climate. So why am I making this differentiation? Why are we talking about this? We're going to come back to feelings again and again in our um, few minutes together. But I also have to ask another question. Are coincidences becoming more common? 
don't know, but are we becoming more aware of them? I think so. So let me ask this question, why and why now? I think the first thing is that we're facing a lot of threats. And I think that we are ourselves personally and as a societal and cultural level reacting to those threats. And the first is that we're disconnected, terribly deracinated from forces outside of ourselves, nature. One of the things that I get everybody to do before they do anything else, if I want them to start noticing more, become more sensitive to coincidence and synchronicity, other matters, is to get into nature periodically. And I have some very specific exercises I do with patients and people. We've also been disconnected from each other. And it's not just because of the internet. I mean, just think about it. But we have far fewer intimate relationships than we used to. The average number of friends that people have in the United States now is five. And I don't count Facebook friends. I mean, proper friends, but you can relate to it. And we've become disconnected from our myths and stories. You may say, well, it's because we have a new world and we all know that's all a load of silliness. It's childish. No, actually, you can't be connected from stuff that is absolutely at your core. I can tell you, having done a lot of meditation work and embodied work with people, that many of these stories, myths, archetypes are actually located inside your body some of them you know, actually in your tummy you can feel them in people we've also become absolutely wound up with short-termism think about this has anybody here needed to go online to see what was happening in the world in the last 24 hours now compare what would have happened 200 years ago where well, you would have got a newspaper if you were lucky and it would have told you what had happened last week but it also means that with everything, we're getting far too wound up with our own agenda, our own time course. And it's undermining us and it's causing us to freak out. We're getting what we call temporal exhaustion. As um, Ellen Bolding once said, if one's mentally out of breath all the time from dealing with the present, there's no energy left for imagining the future. And that's right, because we're all of us getting so stuck into dealing with day-to-day -day stuff i say to people all the time get out of your head and stop running around like a headless chicken she says, but i've got to go to school i've got to be in school and I'm going, blah, 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 blah. yeah and now you're surprised that you're having trouble communicating with your spiritual life you're not noticing coincidences you're not noticing synchronicities there's another phenomenon that most of us have never much thought about it really is about sleep deprivation but what about dream deprivation this is actually becoming an increasing issue. We've known for years that if you uh, sleep deprive people, the real problem that they get eventually is not from not sleeping, it's from not dreaming. And they eventually, after about 10 days or so, most people start developing psychosis from the dreams breaking through. And this has been discussed in the literature for about 130 years that we have known about this, but it's been largely forgotten. That's a big one. It's also why people who take medications like uh, benzodiazepines, the, the Xanaxes, the, um, the Valiums and so on, that mess up dreams often don't actually get much better from taking them because they help temporarily, but actually can mess them up. We have what we call this regressive, regressive tribalism. Everybody is falling into tribes. Again, it's not just the internet. Why is this happening? It's happening because people feel overwhelmed by complexity and they want some kind of security because they've lost their stories. They've lost where they are in society. It sounds so old fashioned now, but in the Bhagavad Gita, one of the things that it actually talks about is that if society, society will collapse, if people forget their roles, and that doesn't mean, you know, you have to be down there and you have to be up there. It means if you don't know where you're supposed to be, you sometimes find it very difficult to cope. I see this with individuals all the time. We also have what we refer to as knowledge silos. 
why was it that people just talked about Rakus and his poor face and didn't actually relate it more broadly? Well, because people were stuck in their little knowledge silos. This is a, a huge, great problem. I worked for a long time in a research center in London where the entire um, approach was to cross-pollinate different departments so that people were talking to each other. And it was immensely productive that people in different areas would talk and discuss instead of having the uh, hematology researchers over here or the gastroenterology researchers over there all talk to each other. But this is happening throughout society. People are also getting more and more self-absorbed, again, as a reaction to this stressor. And what I see all the time is we're in a constant state of hyper arousal. Again, look at the news. Heavens above, even the weather channel can't just tell you what the weather's going to be like today. Think about this. They have to be jumping up and down and say, oh, we could get a hurricane in the middle of Virginia <laughs> this afternoon. No, I don't think so, but we could. <laughs> we might get you know this constant, constant hyper arousal that causes inflammation, physical inflammation. And what do we say just a moment ago? The immune system and the brain are intimately interrelated. So we're also changing as people and noticing more, far more rapidly than people recognize. I have a little table I use and a program I do sometimes where I talk about some of the changes that have occurred since 1905 in the United States. And they are beyond remarkable. Just as a simple, for instance, our bodies today have within them about 200 chemicals, synthetic chemicals, that our grandparents did not. And many of them are metabolically active. But there are some other things. There's still a great question as to why human beings have became known once as the naked apes. Why aren't we covered in fur? Um, there's been a lot of discussion that it may have to do with temperature regulation. Nobody really knows. Lactose tolerance, that's less than 7,000 years old, as are blue eyes. If you'd been walking around the world 8,000 years ago, you wouldn't have found anybody with blue eyes. Then suddenly blue eyes appeared in three parts of the world simultaneously. We think... It again may have to do with lactose tolerance and this a long story, but the point at issue is that we are changing. We've been losing our wisdom teeth and changing the structure of our jaws. That matters because for millennia, that multiple millennia of millennia, we have learned facial recognition to recognize facial expressions, emotion. Well, what happens if the structure of your jaw changes? And it has over the last three or 400 years because our diets have got softer. Disease resistance has changed dramatically, in part because, believe it or not, most of us have some Neanderthal genes that help us. There have been changes in brain structure. We know this from a large number of studies. And we often say, oh, but human brains and chimp brains are the same. I bet you've all heard that. Well, yeah, they are, but there's also some things called human accelerated gene regions. These are parts of the brain that are actually only 64% like chimps, and these are changing very rapidly. And the areas of the brain that are involved in, again, the immune system and some very specific chemical transmitters in the brain, we are becoming more sensitive. I mentioned boundaries, barriers, and divisions are dissolving. What do I mean by that? Most complex phenomena in the brain, all systems of your body, by which I mean the ones where acupuncture meridians are, and so on, we'll come back to a moment, they are, are dispersed. They are not single points. They are actually dispersed all over. They're more like fuzzy things. We see this in quantum structure. We see it within the brain, this predictive brain I referred to. And also what we use as definition of species. Let me show you an example. I bet some of you have seen a picture like this. This is actually in my little library here. Pictures that show what different parts of the brain did. 
in the early 19th century. It was some very famous papers that said that, oh, you've got something here, got a lump in your head. That means you're cautious. Apparently, when I was a very small child, a lady came along and put her hands all over my head and told my parents what I was supposed to be like. I don't think it worked out because, in actual fact, this is how the brain works. This is just one single, simple visual task. The whole brain is involved. It's not just one little area. It's like smudge. There are no big barriers. Breaking down of barriers is very intimidating. But some of you have seen pictures like this, chakras. Are they open in people? Probably not. But they also are not discreet. They tend to merge into each other until we get more evolved, spiritually, emotionally. And then they seem to begin to differentiate. So let me tell you a little bit more. One of the phenomena that many of us in here today have experienced is when something suddenly happens, you get very distressed about something, an interpersonal relationship perhaps, or something else that's happening in your life. And you suddenly start getting odd sensations. You start crying. You start getting a lot of other physical sensations. And when that happens afterwards, you start noticing things. Is this simply a psychological reaction to so you don't feel so bad about something horrible? No, actually, it turns out that it's something very physical. It's not just a psychological reaction. Sometimes these reactions to upset and so on can be gentle. Sometimes they're radical. I had a patient once upon a time that jumped out of a window. Fortunately, he hit a something soft underneath it he, he should have died but it actually that shock was enough to cure him of two very severe illnesses for about six months and that is not at all unknown sometimes we get it from healings from accidents synchronicities near-death experience or shared experiences what do i mean by that people who are with somebody who is departing this world often have, and it is often, it's not a rare thing, simultaneous experiences. I've seen this with people taking LSD, that they also precisely the same thing at the same time. And I've seen some also with shamanistic journeying, people hearing the same music, seeing the same trees, all at precisely the same time. These barriers between individuals, they break down. When that happens, you start noticing, again, this vaster world, this larger reality. So let me get to uh, some other last ideas, concepts that relate to all of this. One of the hallmarks of a coincidence or a synchronicity, for me, a coincidence and a synchronicity are similar, but a synchronicity by definition for me, also has um, intense meaning attached to it. They are, of course, sudden and unexpected. They often don't follow the usual laws of timing. Bernie Beitman, who's on the call today, was kind enough to um, ask me to talk to him a few weeks ago, and I was telling him about one particular event that had occurred in my life where several things happened at precisely the same moment. And this is quite a common phenomenon that these things seem to happen out of time. The closest that I have seen to this sudden unexpected is actually of all things in a creation or even in a joke. Arthur Kessler, back in the 1960s, I think, 1962, 64, wrote a book called The Act of Creation. And in that, he talks a lot about how we tend to go along on one tram line, and then suddenly something happens. That's an act of creation. It's also the punchline of a joke, not when people are being witty or telling puns, but a really good joke. It's suddenly, 
that was a shock. The same thing happens with a real synchronicity that it shocks you out of the tram lines. Well, let's look at this a bit more. It's in effect, the world is no longer carrying on the same way it did. So why would this happen? I think it's happening as a reaction to all of the things we talked about just a few moments ago. This sudden surprise, this sudden moving off the tram lines, endorses the idea that there's a deeper layer of meaning. Sometimes people look for meaning where there isn't any. Again, there's a compensation. I had a patient once upon a time who was struggling with a major mental illness. She didn't want treatment, though, because she believed when something bad had happened that any man who was near her was actually John the Baptist. That was the meaning for her. She didn't want treatment for that because that was what helped her to cope. But what I'm suggesting here is a real synchronicity is something that is deeply meaningful and is not accessible to the intellect. And it's in the world of feelings rather than affects or emotions or intellect. These things affect us very deeply at the feeling level. And I'm going to say one more thing about this before we finish, because these feelings produce long-term change. They're supposed to, but that is where we pick up vibrations in the world that are, of changes. It's at the level of feelings, synchronicity, coincidences. They first excite a feeling that may get elaborated into an affect or an emotion. And of course, eventually that might change our mood. But the point is, it's always that first extremely rapid change that's important. The next thing is, I think it's valuable to actually change our perspective a little bit in the same way that people were missing out on the true story of Rakus the orangutan because there was no perspective to it. It was a cool story, cool story, next cool story. They weren't actually seeing that it was actually informing us about something really important. And it was nested in this whole animal knowing and human knowing. So I think it's useful to try and look at everything from a different perspective rather than becoming entrained in emotional contagion, social contagion, what everybody else believes. We do this with patients all the time because they often get really stuck with one approach. The most valuable exercise that we have been using for decades now is to get an external perspective, what I call not just to look at the world from 30,000 feet, but also from 30,000 years. Because if you can just for a moment shift your perspective, it's actually immensely helpful to you personally and to your sensitivity to phenomena so you don't get overwhelmed by them. And we'll look one more time at perspective before we finish. The other big one that we oftentimes don't discuss is what I call reverence and awe. Now, these are very old-fashioned terms. In fact, most people want to throw up when I say this the first time because oh, I want to be reverent. I don't want to have awe. But actually, I'm going to suggest that having lost our reverence and our awe, we're kind of missing out. We tend to notice coincidences and synchronicities more when we feel the world with reverence and all. What I mean by that is if we believe, we think that the world around us is indeed suffused with meaning, that we're actually embedded in something much larger, and we begin to really notice it, things start popping up all over the place. So let me take that a step further. This is something from that I've um, rewritten from something I think that Rudolf Steiner said, that reverence awakens in the soul a sympathetic power through which you attract qualities and beings around you which would otherwise remain concealed. I think it's one of the things that we miss out on sometimes. 
again, we've been doing this with individuals and with groups of people for a very long time now to try and help. And as we said, with, with symptoms and dreams, you need to interpret because otherwise it's like we said from Babylon, Babylonian Talmud, it's like a, a letter that you ain't read. That's always a shame. If you want to notice things, you want to understand them, you want to get something out of them, you have to interpret them. Simply passively cataloging experiences may just stump them because why on earth would the universe continue giving you experiences if you keep on saying, not interested, go away. It was cool that I happened to notice something as I was driving past. There was a picture of a dog and I used to own a dog like that. Okay, what does that mean? Don't know, but it was cool. If you do that, don't expect these images to continue. We've known for years, if you have somebody in therapy, and you ignore the dreams, they stop coming. I mean, why should your unconscious continue sending you messages? The last major group of things is detachment. This is one of the most important conditions for meaningful coincidences to appear. It has been research done over the years about whether for example, meditators or whether there's certain personality types that may make it more likely for you to experience coincidences and synchronicities. And some have said yes, some have said no. I think part of the problem is that if we just take meditation, because I know this is one area that's been looked at, there are more than 500 different types of meditation. And they all try to do slightly different things. But the key thing is not whether you've been a meditator or whether you have a certain personality. It's whether you lead to detachment from them. If you start detaching from outcomes, I can tell you from experience and having taken a lot of people through this, you start noticing coincidences and synchronicities all over the place. As we start moving away from being totally self-preoccupied with the ego, we begin to notice events outside that previously would have said, ah, it's just coincidence, just magical thinking, not real. But actually, as you start letting go and you start getting more involved with helping other people, getting out of your own head a little bit, so you start noticing more and more. I want to finish with a couple of things. The first is what actually elevates a coincidence to be more than that, to being what I would call a synchronicity. The first is that it actually, it changes us, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, but it induces a new rhythm in our bodies. The idea of rhythms in bodies and in minds is a huge topic and one for another day, but we start moving beyond just the ego. There are also some other things that both I and others have noticed for a long time that once you have a meaningful coincidence, certain things happen, you often get an influx of spiritual energy. Again, you're not going to see this if you're stuck in your ego. You're just worried about um, what John said yesterday or Brenda said yesterday or what somebody said in the news or in politics. If you're stuck with there, you're not going to notice this. But as you start moving a little bit further, you start noticing this change of rhythm, this change in spiritual energy. You also start noticing something else. You oftentimes begin to notice the change in the quality of light around you and around other people. It's transient, but it's often very noticeable. Circadian rhythms change, sometimes a lot. We also start noticing changes that we might think are in our ability to imagine things and a kind of a self-organization. We often get some very specific, predictable physical symptoms. Now, these are particularly felt in the abdomen, sometimes around the heart, but usually in the top of the abdomen and sometimes a little bit lower down in, what's in China and Japan, they call the hara. And you often get very 
interesting odd symptoms there for flutterings sometimes um, one I can talk about was getting odd sensations in the diaphragm and the upper abdominal muscles and that had to do with the coincidence was actually becoming more potent and meaningful and like I said moving off the tram lines a sudden taking you into a, a new realm synchronicities often move from potentials like all those little creatures like rakers the orangutan there were lots of possibilities in front of him how did he find the right one how does somebody know that she needs to talk to a complete stranger about her medical history and basically there are lots of potential possibilities, but and that a synchronicity makes it actual. It's almost like a suspension becoming crystallized. It becomes self-organized. We also have something else that I think is interesting. That's one of the things about coincidence and synchronicity is they tend to be very ambiguous, these phenomena, because a skeptic will often say, oh, it's just one of those things. Many of us have spent a lot of time trying to prove that it's not just one of those things. There's something else. People will often say, well, is it A or is it B? And what I've said playfully is if you say, as I often have to folks, it's both. <laughs> you often think their brains are going to explode. People start spluttering, getting extremely upset <laughs> when you say this. What do I mean by this? The whole idea of is it A or is it B thinking is actually very recent. And by very recent, I mean probably only in the last three or four hundred years. Before that, people were much more comfortable with being able to hold several possibilities in their mind's eye at the same time. There's a, a book that Juliet and I were discussing very briefly and beforehand, a wonderful book I highly recommend called The Master and His Emissary uh, by Ian McGilchrist, where he talks a lot about um, why we have two different brains in our heads that perceive the world in completely different ways. The right hemisphere basically can hold lots of possibilities in mind at once. The left has a lot of trouble. It wants an A or a B. And the more that we can actually live in this sort of more right, ambiguous way, the more we actually can expect to have experiences. And again, they kick us into realizing that it's not always A and B. When I first decided to um, go to the Maudsley Hospital in London to do psychiatry, I well remember meeting a very eminent um, psychiatrist, neuropsychiatrist who'd written the standard textbook. And he said to me, you've been very good and done very well in internal medicine. He said, there's one big change. Can you live with ambiguity? I said, hmm. He said, because if you can't, go back to doing internal medicine and neurology because ambiguity is the name of the game. Ambiguity is actually crucial. That's where healing happens. He was right, completely right. We often talk about imagination. Imagination is a faculty that I encourage everybody to try and um, improve because it's not the same as make-believe. Imagination, yes, it's rooted in belief. And one of the issues that has been very interesting and a number of individuals, a number of authors, um, a number of people I talk to have been discussing the way in which imagination sometimes seems to open a what we might call a psychic portal. It's almost as if we're able to materialize things in the physical environment. This has been discussed a great deal with things like um, appearances of um, UFOs, um, apparitions, that sort of thing. But we've seen it a great deal also happen with imagination and what we refer to as the imaginal realm. This is a term that was coined quite a long time ago. 
that the idea is this. Our world has a physical side, beautiful explanations for everything physical going on in the world, from the smallest particles up to the cosmos. The second world, which is actually, if you like, more real, that is the spiritual underlying, and the, between the two of them is what we call the imaginal realm. It's almost like a third force that interweaves constantly the physical and the spiritual realms. This is where synchronicities and coincidences occur all the time. They emerge into our physical world. And the more sensitive you are, the more you notice them. There's also another couple of brief things. Whenever we think about coincidence, there's also what we call cultural congruence. Some of you will be familiar with this. It's been spoken about for millennia. But when people die, the candles in the house go out. It's actually what led to the original theory that something leaves the body when somebody dies, something physical, actually, like a wind leaving the body. It actually came from this observation. And it's transcultural. More recently, there's been the idea of clocks stop when people die. I don't know if any of you have ever heard of that experience, but um, I've had it a couple of times. Um, you know, the work I've done over the years, obviously, uh, I'm sometimes called upon to be with um, bereaved or recently bereaved people. And we also have cultural metaphors. So since ancient China, a lot of our thoughts about how energy flows in the body has all been hydraulic. Psychology picked up on this in the late 19th century. Freudian theory is all based on the idea that there are strange changes in water pressure. They don't call it that. They call it something different. They call it psychic energy, but basically it's the same idea. And then more recently, we've been moving towards computer metaphors and quantum metaphors and near everything metaphors. It's one of the reasons I wanted to tell you just a tiny bit today about how the brain is constantly hunting around. So the last thing is, can we, or should we master coincidence? There are two stages I think of enhancing coincidence. The first is just to become more aware of them. I think we've all seen that. The second is to cultivate their appearance. And I'm going to ask a question that I often have to ask people who get in touch with me. I'm constantly contacted by people that have suddenly discovered they have become healers or that some other interesting things happen in their lives. And I'll often say to these new healers, because it's invariably after something major has happened in their lives, like a, they've been seriously ill or had an accident or something, I'll say it'll should pass because they said, well, I don't want it to. I want to remain a healer. And just say, yeah, the trouble with that is it's going to exhaust you and it's going to burn you out. And they'll say, well, I don't care. Um, I want to be a healer. And I then ask them the next question. What would happen if people in the world out there discovered that you could heal anything? It's like the other question. If people discovered that you could bring up synchronicities to order, you could predict everything. What would happen to you? They'd say, oh, this would be cool. I said, no, I'm worried that you might end up living in a gilded cage in some dictatorship somewhere in the world. People wouldn't, would want to keep you for themselves. So we can all become more sensitive to promptings. I've given you a couple of ideas. Mastering coincidence and synchronicity, I think, is a slightly different matter. Can it be done? I think it can. And I have a lot of reasons for saying that, not least because there's literature going back for millennia of how shamans, Taoist masters, um, people in many traditions in the West and in India, Mongolia, have also apparently succeeded sometimes in producing phenomena for themselves, but usually for others. But it requires a huge investment of time and self-mastery and sacrifice. It's not something you can just do on a Tuesday morning. And I think that's 
certainly the case. I don't know if there's a quick way of doing this. So what can we take away? It is my belief perception based on what I've been discussing with you in the last few minutes, that we're all embedded in this vast, expansive, what I refer to as a web of light and life. And it's interesting because one of the concepts that's been discussed in the, many of the, the traditions for a long time is that the subconscious world of which we're familiar, which merges into the unconscious, these are two separate phenomena, is actually the world of life. The superconscious, which leads into the higher self, the over self, the Atman, that is the world of light. And they're all supporting this, uh, this web that we live in all the time. And this web is conscious. I believe, I know, that it's talking to us all the time. But most of us don't listen. I know I didn't always listen. It's multi-leveled. I've used this word polysimus before. It means it's suffused with meaning. And it lies behind and below everything. Behind subatomic particles, as well as the farthest reaches of the universe. It's a very interesting phenomenon that many meditators experience when they've been at it for a while. That they begin to let go of the ego. They start floating around. And some of them actually are able to go back and start noticing the beginning of the universe and even sink down smaller than an atom. And this is something that I've known many people to do spontaneously without apparently reading about it or hearing about it. Why should that be? Why would they have all the same experience? Is it a real experience? Yes, it certainly is. But because we're in this web, I also know something else, that you can oftentimes obtain information when it is necessary. There's a story, and I have many like this. A patient came to be seen. He was very, very, very distressed. And he um, uh, only spoke Polish. And he came in, and the translator was parking the car, and came straight in and started telling his story because he was very upset and a few minutes later in comes a translator and says oh i did not know that you spoke polish no don't not a single word no idea but you've just been speaking perfect polish to the patient. oh okay that was nothing clever the person was in enormous distress he needed help so this web sometimes gives you answers. Sometimes they come out as a coincidence, a synchronicity. Sometimes you might see a, something like you have ever seen one of those. Or it may come out as suddenly gabbling in Polish. If you ask me anything in Polish right now, don't know a single word. That day, that person, great distress, needed help. Same thing with a coincidence or a synchronicity. With that, thank you very much for listening to me. Juliet, back over to you. Juliet, I think you're... Mm -hmm. Coming back you're, on, yeah. You're coming back on. Yes. I think we can, you can probably do the, um, stop screen share now. We certainly can. If I can go here. All right, here we are. Okay, I'm back. <laughs> Yes. Hello, everyone. Yeah, I had got a pop up from something else that was happening in Zoom right as you uh, um, concluded and said, Juliet, over to you. And I got a pop up that wouldn't allow me to come back. Um, but here we it's are. It's been one of those things. Where I'm just very <laughs> grateful that the universe decided not to send us any more thunderstorms just while we were talking. So I think that's a, a sign that uh, we actually needed to be talking today. <laughs> but Yes. Maybe it's just a coincidence, but I personally happen to think it's a sign that we should be talking today.
Indeed. We'd love to hear some thoughts and reflections or questions from those of you with us. You are welcome to click on more at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And then under reactions, you can click on raise hand. And that way we know you um, have a comment or a question. And somebody can also just come off mute and pop on and be our first to begin um, continuing the dialogue. We have another 15 minutes to talk together. And thank you, Richard, that was fantastic. Well, I actually want kudos because I was watching my clock. I, I just have to tell everybody that Julius and I were discussing beforehand and um, uh, I'm often teased mercilessly because I'm supposed to go over time. I swear I don't, but I have my clock up here and I was absolutely convinced I was going to get it right today. <laughs> so you can tell me <laughs> off. <laughs> Yes, and Allison uh, puts in the chat, thank you, universe. <laughs> <laughs> Glad the force is aligned. Well, uh, yes, or maybe thank you, Thor, for not sending any more lightning strikes today. <laughs> I see Bernie is off of mute. Richard, thanks a lot. Uh, it's great to hear you. Uh, and there's so much you said that uh, is worth commenting on, but one of the things you said is uh, meditation isn't it. It's the ability to be separate from, to step back from, uh, distance yourself from. You'd use a different word for that. And I, Detachment I, term I use. The, yes, that's Detachment right. is the word you use. Um, the thing that attaches, if I can use the word thing, uh, I tend to call the self-observer. And I wonder if you would comment on that self-observer capacity that each of us has and each of us doesn't very much use, except as you call it detachment. But what is it that is then detached is what I'm asking you about. Ah, uh, the witness. The witness. Um, yeah, this is witness consciousness. And you're, you're absolutely right now. Witness consciousness, it's very interesting that... Um, this has been most developed in the Hindu tradition, um, where it's um, regarded also as the fourth state or Turiya, um, the witness consciousness, because why it's so important is that the witness consciousness um, isn't located in time, it isn't located in space, it's outside of the two of them, and it is, in my humble estimation, uh, where our synchronicities come from. And that's where they come into life. If you do meditation on a regular basis um, and you work at it, not just do 10 minutes here and there, one of the things that does begin to emerge is you develop more and more witness consciousness and you begin to detach from your ego. And First of all, you need to build up your ego because otherwise you're not going to have enough of the strength to be able to get witness consciousness. It's always this strange paradox because people say, on the one hand, you're telling me to build up my ego. On the other hand, you're telling me to give it up. No, I'm asking you to structure and strengthen your ego so that it can merge with the witness consciousness. And when that happens, that's when you start living in a somewhat different world and you discover that all the things I said are not high-flown fantasies. They're real personal experiences. So um, there's a, another thing I would say that's related since you brought this up is that people often say that they want to meditate in order to learn to relax. Say, actually, you need to relax in order to learn to meditate. Uh, you need to change your diet in order to learn to meditate. It's like somebody said, I'm going to kickboxing to get fit. And I said, how often are you doing it? And they said, once a week. I said, no, you get fit to do kickboxing. And it's, I think it's the same phenomenon, but yes, um, we've both of us done this with individuals um, in therapy, that as you get better witness consciousness, you begin to notice things. It always distresses me when people want to get stuck down and they don't get perspective. That's why I talk about trying to get the perspective from 30,000 feet and 30,000 years because I have to break something to you, Bernie, neither you or I am going to be here in 30,000 years. And um, <laughs> sorry to break it to you. I know that's a very distressing concept, but at least you won't be there and I won't be up here and you, you won't be BB. Um, but will we still exist? Personally, I believe yes, but in changed form. 
But if you actually start looking at the world from that perspective, does anything that matters today matter that much or happens today? Not really. If you're looking at it from 30,000 feet, you start seeing things very differently. That's where the witness consciousness lives. Make sense? Is that how you see it, Bernie? No. You... We are going to talk about this some more. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Great. We had a, a question posted in the chat by Mark um, to ask Richard if you've read uh, Babel by Rebecca, Rebecca Huang, and if so, what you thought of it. I have not. Congratulations. You found a book I haven't read. Um, <laughs> that, that's actually kind of funny because um, we live on, uh, out in rural Georgia, and um, uh, apparently we're supposed to have one of the largest libraries in the state. I don't know if that's true, but so we've been told. But I've never heard of the book, so... Okay, made note, we'll read. Mark says you're going to love it. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> Always good to have, come away with a nice book recommendation. Absolutely. <laughs> I have the ones by Ian McGilchrist, which came up by coincidence because he lived on the Isle of Skye, the location of this beautiful um, walking uh, circular labyrinth called Fairy Circle. So, and now um, after the Isle of Skye, we have Delia Sky has a question, so we'll stay with the Sky theme here and uh, bring Delia <laughs> up to ask a question. <laughs> okay, um, thank you so much, um, Doctor. It has been, uh, Doctor Petty. It's really been um, uh, very useful and practical and uh, good uh, occasion to hear you. I have a question. Um, how I can be of assistance to a very close friend because she um, just just a lot. She's not on, and I wish she was. Uh, almost two years ago, well, first she is a spiritual leader of a nonprofit community here in Saint Petersburg called Sacred Lands Education and Preservation. And been here for years and years and years. She just turned 76. About uh, almost two years ago, she was on the property and uh, she had a coincidence where she tripped and fell and there was a big rock right in the path of her right eye. And she fell on that rock and she lost her eye. And, uh, you know, that, you know, it's just uh, an experience, yes. But this whole time she has been searching or looking into what happened, why, why did this happen to her, you know. Um, and uh, she has now, she's come almost two years, she has a shell eye. And it looks very much like her good eye. And she has to wear glasses and she does everything. But as a close friend, she's constantly asking me, how can I deal with this? What can I do? What am I missing? And I think many of the things that you covered today are kind of an automatic answer to this. But I would also, uh, because we concentrate on synchronicity and coincidences constantly every day and it's no coincidence that you're speaking today that speaks directly to what is the heartfelt way that I would like to be with her to just keep her rolling along with her inquiry because even as we do a meditation we do med she does she meditates probably 50 hours a week because everything they do there, Qigong, um, we do Qigong, they do Tai Chi, we have a feast meditation, there's Reiki, you know, there's probably 10 events a month that are all mm -hmm. addressing this. So I really get what you're saying about how meditation is not necessarily the route to the portal for her to really discover 
what it is, is her mission now. With one eye, you know, she said it isn't that she's not refusing to see. Oh, no. It's that, yes. yeah. If I may, there's a couple of sure. things. One of them that you just said, um, we oftentimes, um, and uh, I know that um, Juliet and Bernie and I have all discussed this outside of today, is that sometimes synchronicities and coincidences are not positive. You know, for so many people, um, there's always been the assumption that coincidences like pink fluffy bunnies and unicorns. Um, and actually, that's not the way it works at all. Um, sometimes other things do happen. And one of the key points here is that as you start doing more things correctly, and this always, what I mean by that is moving in a positive spiritual direction, it's almost as if people get a target on their back. And it's the term I've used many times that many organizations have had exactly the same thing happen. If you think about the history of um, most of the positive movements, let's just think of the Theosophical Society, the Anthroposophists, the, um, uh, lots of these other groups, every one of them, when the leader dies or passes on or something, they're absolutely riven they, and they're smashed up. And it happens all the time that the more positive you are, the more you get negative adieu thrown at you. Um, there's actually, you may be familiar with the concept of wetico um, or wedigo. Uh, it's actually derived from a Native American term that there are actually um, separate evil forces in this world that are disembodied, discarnate, that actually do stuff. And it, it's in one of those things that you hear it initially and you think, what well, that's a load of old rot. Um, but actually, no, it's not. And one encounters evil, unpleasant, nasty forces all the time. Uh, something I would talk about at some length privately, perhaps. But the one of the immediate questions I would have is, is it possible your friend's overdoing it? Um, I recently did a, a little um, presentation for another organization where I was talking about what we refer to as diseases of discipleship. It's an old term. But this is actually what sometimes happens to people when they um, are spending a lot of time um, on spiritual path and they get a lot of physical and psychological um, things happen to them. For example, this all started, and this, this may be highly pertinent. Um, I had a, a person who was sent to see me um, some years ago when I was working as an endocrinologist. Um, she had developed an overactive thyroid um, and it transpired and she was sent by a, a superb endocrinologist and they were looking at surgery and it happened because she'd been doing yoga work and trying this practice that I'm not a fan of, of opening chakras and she'd been working on her throat chakra and this had actually overstimulated the thyroid. So I gave her some exercises told her, and she didn't want to come back to London to see me because long journey in England <laughs> um, and I ran into her um, at a meeting about 18 months later um, and she just walked up to me and I, I almost didn't recognize her because she said oh, I did that yeah it cured me thank you very much I just didn't want to come back to London London sucks <laughs> and um, so my question then would always be whether in fact um, the individual's overdoing it and also I'd like to know what her higher self is saying to her not what you and she are saying or um, the people with her. I have to say, I don't know this centre, um, but it sounds idyllic. But again, you can overdo it. And sometimes you just start sucking in negative energy from other people. Uh, so you mentioned um, a term that was Native American. So yes, it's Wetiko, W-E-T-I-K-O. W E T I K O. It's also spelt Wendigo, which is W E N D I G O. Wendigo. Yes, it's it's the same phenomenon, and um, there's actually literature in every tradition that I've ever studied, and that's more than one, um, that has suggested that such negative 
factors can come into life. And the more you're doing the right thing, it's like I have had several friends who, as soon as they've gone off on a spiritual path, wham, they get walloped, usually by a family member. Um, you know, mother says, you need to get a proper job and stop all this going to that Buddhist monastery stuff, um, that sort of thing. And um, actually, is it mum or is it something working through mum? The answer is it's usually something. Yes. Working well, this mom. land is a Native a, American it land. <laughs> it's Native American land. Uh, it's the Tokabaka Indians from 1525. The property is totally Native American. Thank you. Should be it. Thanks, Juliet. I, I'm extremely aware because I, I'm trying to be a. a, a we're right up. We're going to have to wrap and on I've time. I've got my, time. my <laughs> big clock here, and I know if I go any longer, it's going to start shooting x rays at me or something. Or yeah. laser beams. And uh, <laughs> Richard, um, do you have a way that folks might contact you that you are comfortable sharing? We can put it in the chat just for our group or say it aloud for yes. the replay um, audience as well. <laughs> The email which you have, um, you're welcome to put in there. I request people keep it fairly short because um, I do get around about 200 messages a day. Mm. And um, uh, I know that my brain's going to explode if I get any more. The second thing is, if you are interested, um, I did put together a brief reading list um, from which everything from today is, is based in. If you would like um, mm. a copy of that, Juliet, I will. Um, it's a little PDF file. Um, and I just decided to stick with books rather than research papers as well. If you'd like a copy, I'll just shoot it over to you. And then anybody on the call or in the replay is very welcome to ask you for it. And that would be fine. Yes. Yes. Thank you. That would be wonderful. Um, we actually have a, a resource library available on our website. And so I can post this. Um, perhaps we need a whole new category of bibliographies. <laughs> 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 of uh, other people's cultivated resources rather than turning it into individual entries for each thing that you um, share. And uh, so we do have a, about 250 different resources relating to coincidences and synchronicity, serendipity, intuition, dreams, quantum phenomena, you name it. We have all kinds of things. Just go to thecoincidenceproject.net, N-E-T, and click on resources. I think it's um, labeled learn a place to learn. So click on the link that says learn. And then there's many, many resources. And also our story forum is linked there that you can leave your own stories and read hundreds of stories from folks all over the world that are sharing stories there together. And our blog, which um, those of us uh, board members and invited guests and hosts of programs um, are, are invited to contribute to our blog as well with other articles of interest. Um, thank you so much, Richard. This is wonderful. And I hope we'll have you back again and uh, and go deeper or take a different slant on things and, and have you back at Speaker Series before before too long, maybe next year sometime. 2025, doesn't it sound like sci-fi? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you very much indeed for the invitation, Juliet. Thank you, everybody, for being here. And um, uh, keep watching because you will find more and more of these coincidence and synchronicities and they will talk to you uh, there's no question but most important yeah. detach from the outcome and they will come if you're trying to use them to try and play the stock market forget it if you want them because they're going to help somebody else then they'll arrive thank you very much mm -hmm. thank you so much thank you richard until next time everyone we hope to see you again next event will be coincidence cafe on the third saturday of august All right bye everyone Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much.